So we're talking about conversations that change your world. And today what I'd like to talk about is big picture praying. Uh, hopefully, this last week, you've had opportunity to pray simple and powerful prayers. We practiced this last week. Heavenly Father, please release and whatever is needed to the person you're praying for in Jesus' name. And uh, sometimes that doesn't feel like that's not nearly enough, but please remember that the purpose of prayer is not to impress anyone, it's to ask God for help. And that's the difference. So our faith is not in how well we ask. Our faith is in the one that we are asking. He's the one who does all things well. And this morning, as in every message of this series, uh, we're going to begin by reciting the Lord's Prayer together. If you don't know it by heart, it's okay. It'll be up on the screen. And let's lift our voice and declare it together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Jesus wasn't just teaching us a prayer to recite. He was teaching us principles to address in our conversations with God. Uh, I'm going to take a passage this morning from Luke chapter 22. And this is uh, Jesus in his last supper with the disciples before his crucifixion. If you know uh, from the various gospels, there are a number of things that occurred in that conversation and in that evening. And this is Luke's account of that. And this is what it says beginning in verse 24. A dispute also arose among them, that's the disciples, as to which of them was considered to be the greatest. This is the Last Supper. And the conversation has shifted to who's the greatest. And Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. You are those who have stood by me in my trials, and I confer on you a kingdom just as my father conferred one on me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, sometimes when we look at scripture, we think of it as a library of books uh, that has been collected over the course of history. And that's not a bad analogy, but when you go into a library, uh, there is no connection between all the books. They're organized and they're categorized so that we can find them by author or by topic, but there really isn't any unifying theme. And yet in a book there is. That's why we often refer to the Bible as a book. While it has many contributing authors, it is really one book, and there is a unifying or overarching theme. There's a meta-narrative as to what God is doing in our world. And if we don't know what that big picture is, then a lot of the small pieces in Scripture and in our lives seem to not make sense. We get confused by them or frustrated with them. If we don't understand the meta-story of redemption, we wind up settling for less in our lives. The challenge with human beings is not that we've tried to grasp for too much, it's that we have settled for far too little. And so, so we need to know what this big picture, big story is. Jesus actually calls us into the school of discipleship, not just to experience forgiveness, though that is the first thing that happens, but also that we would experience real transformation, that our lives are not just a matter of knowing different things, but actually becoming something else. 
there's something and someone he wants us to be. And that we actually become agents of transformation in the world. We don't just experience his grace, we express it and pass it on in ways that actually make a difference in the world in which we live. We are to be contagious with kingdom life. We're to be contagious with peace. We're to be contagious with hope. This is what's fascinating is that if you are hopeless, you are stuck. There's no reason to take a step if you, you don't have any hope that it will make any difference. But when you have hope, you can take a step. When you have faith, you can take a step. When you have peace, you can take a step. You're not crippled, you're not paralyzed, you're not debilitated by all the fears and frustrations that attend our lives and our thoughts. So we're to be contagious with kingdom life. And that's the meta narrative. That's the picture. That's the overarching story of Scripture, is that it's about a kingdom. Jesus talked more about the kingdom of God than any other topic, and there isn't a close second. He talked a lot about the kingdom. So what, what is he telling us? Well, the first thing we need to know is that there was a kingdom that was forfeited. It was lost. It was given up. Genesis actually teaches us that humans were put in a beautiful place and they were told something really interesting. Take what is good and make it better. Rule, exercise dominion, make what is really good and take it and make it better. Eden, the Garden of Eden was not a museum where you walked around and, and you marveled at the creation of God. You know, look at that tree. That's a beautiful tree. That's a wonderful tree. Don't touch. There was a tree they weren't supposed to eat, but everything else they could enjoy. So they weren't just walking around looking and categorizing and naming. They were actually supposed to take things and develop them and, and to cultivate them and, and to expand them and all of these things. And in fact, every day God would come in the cool of the day and Adam and Eve would have conversations. And, and these conversations are likely to have been the kinds of conversations about how do we expand what is good here? How do we increase fruitfulness here? How do we begin to do even better and more things here. And no doubt God, because he created everything, would have a lot of information. Like maybe they wanted to, you see that section over there? Wouldn't it be great if we put this kind of plant in there? And God would say, well, that's a really good idea, except that section has a lot of direct sunlight. And that plant doesn't work so well in direct sunlight. It might work better over here. And God wasn't going, you have no right to change the plants in the garden. Who do you think you are? He wanted them to succeed. He wanted them to develop. He wanted them to rule. And so out of those conversations, those personal conversations with God, they began to yield increased creativity and fruitfulness. But because of their fall, that kingdom was ruined. They gave up that kingdom. The first humans made a decision to reject God's will and replace it with their own. Satan comes along and his temptation is, if you eat this one fruit that God says you shouldn't eat, you will be like God. And what you should know is that everyone who wants to be like God actually just wants to be God. That's the distinction. They want to call their own shots. They don't want to run anything by anybody. Wouldn't it be great if we could just do what we wanted when we wanted to do it? Only one thing was withheld from them. Only one rule was in the Garden of Eden. And they exercised their free will to violate that rule. And in the process, they lost their freedom. Adam and Eve's relationship was significantly stressed. They blamed each other for what happened. Their first children, Cain and Abel, one of them kills the other. You have unbelievable division in the marriage and a murder in, in the first uh, brothers in human history. And this is just the first family after the kingdom is forfeited. This is the effects on our world. There are three basic consequences for having forfeited the kingdom and the ruin that it has created in our world. And the first is that we've moved from ruling out of relationship to reacting to what's wrong. They used to have conversations and develop, and now they're reacting to the thorns and the thistles and, and the, blood and the, the blood and the sweat and the tears that they've got to work through. The second thing is humanity moved from honest conversation to blame and deception. 
Now they're not being honest and now they're accusing each other of what's gone wrong in the world. And the third thing is their self-centeredness blinded them to another person's needs and another person's potential. And it didn't just stop with them. Every human has been going through that since that time. Every one of us have trouble seeing someone else's need and someone else's potential. Every one of us has the experience of using our conversation where we hide or harbor information in order to have a slight advantage in a conversation. Every one of us find ourselves not walking in the authority God intends for us, but reacting to everything that's going wrong around us. And that effect still lives on today. Our world is marked by brokenness and by darkness at every level of human experience. The natural human response is to blame a God they claim they don't even believe in. The brokenness and the darkness of this world is not the will of God. Everything that causes pain, everything that shortens life, everything that causes lack, everything that you don't like about our world is not the result of God's will. It's the result of human will being imposed and being chosen over God's will. When you get to heaven, there's not anybody that's going to get to heaven and they're going to go, nope, I really liked earth better. I promise it's better in heaven. Why? Because God's will is always done there. We just prayed it. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth just like it's done in heaven. So, a kingdom is forfeited, a kingdom is ruined, but a kingdom also comes. God was not inactive. His strategy was not to crush all that violated his will. His strategy was to redeem and restore what had violated his will. If he had exercised the strategy to crush all that violated his will, not a single human being would have survived that experience because all of us have chosen our own will over God's will multiple times in our lives. We get frustrated at the patience of God. Never interpret the patience of God as the judgment of God, as though he doesn't care, or the apathy of God, he's not around. This is what it says in 2 Peter, the third chapter. The Lord is not slow keeping his promise as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish. Did you hear that? Not wanting anyone to perish. He didn't want you to perish. He didn't want the person sitting next to you to perish. He didn't want the person that you hope wouldn't sit next to you to perish. There's not a single person that he wanted to perish. In fact, but everyone, what's that word? Everyone. Does everyone know what everyone means? Do you want to take a guess? Everyone. Yes. Everyone to come to repentance. So what does God do? He basically sends a second Adam into the world. It's his son. This is what John 10.10 10 tells us. This is what Jesus said. The thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I have come that you might have life and have it to the full. So he comes to be the second Adam, to give us a reboot, a restart, a refresh for humanity so that we can actually be restored to God's original intended purpose for our lives. We are not called just to wait for God to fix everything that's wrong with our world. We are called to invade this broken world by praying that God's will will be done here and now. Just think about that. I know there are some people that you've, you've accepted. Heaven is better, and I'm just, I'm just going to wait for that. Uh, people who aren't suffering too much have that luxury. I mean, don't get me wrong. We could always have more. We could always have more comfortable things, and we could always have lots. You know, we, every, Everyone can think of a way to improve their life in some way, but if you're actually going through suffering, enough is enough. In places of the world where food is in far too short supply, or there's not access to doctors and health care, or torture is the response to someone who puts the name of Jesus on their lips, I can tell you they're not just waiting for heaven. They're praying. They're asking for God's will to be brought into this world right here 
and right now because real people are suffering. That is what we are called to do. Luke's gospel reveals who Jesus said he's going to bestow this kingdom on. Who is he going to confer this kingdom on? And this is what's fascinating. This is the last supper that Jesus is having with his disciples before he has... Uh, he goes through the crucifixion and through the resurrection. This is his last time with them. And he's been spending three years, over three years, with all of these men that are at this table. And by three years, I'm not talking about attending a Sunday worship service for three years. Don't get me wrong, that's a lot. But he lived with these guys 365 days a year every year for over three years. He walked with them. He talked with them. He ate with them. They prayed together. They laughed together. They cried together. They talked about things. Sometimes they even disagreed about things. Like there was a lot, a lot of training went in over those three years. He modeled kingdom behavior. He taught kingdom behavior. When something surfaced in his group that didn't look like kingdom behavior, he challenged it. And you would think that after three over three years, they would get it. But in this last supper with Jesus, the conversation becomes, who is the greatest? How did that happen? Who thought that was a good topic to bring up? How did it get brought up? You know, Maybe somebody said, well, I know I'm not the greatest, but it's not you. There's something in the human heart. It's so ingrained. Please hear this. It's so ingrained that even after spending over three years every day with Jesus, it still pops up. So, well, that's not my problem, Pastor. I don't think I'm the greatest. But you do think you're right. And there's no difference. We all struggle with this. Every one of us. The kingdom is conferred on those who serve. Those who don't demand their way. Those who don't demand their preference. Those who don't demand their agenda. You can build a personal kingdom by making things happen. There are personalities strong enough to go out and get a lot of things done. You can feel superior because you are able to manipulate or intimidate someone else into doing something that you want. But that will never be the kingdom of God, no matter what you call it. The kingdom is conferred on those who serve. Now, we often desire some kind of authority to, to enact our will, but that's not what prayer is. Prayer is authority to exercise God's will. Prayer is authority to exercise God's will. God sent his son to rescue people from all of the ways that death invades our lives. Our, the way it invades our hopes, our dreams, our goals, our ambitions, the way it invades our relationships, our marriages, our relationships with our kids and our friends, the way it invades our economic systems, the way it invades our political systems, the way it invades every aspect of human life. He comes to invade that. And this is what they did with the person who came to fix all of that. They killed him. They killed Jesus. And what did God do about that? Did he say, that was your last chance? and then unleash unbelievable judgment from heaven to make sure that nothing remained on earth. Not another breath would be breathed because all of it was being breathed in rebellion to God. He doesn't do that. You cannot change God's heart or eliminate his effort to redeem and restore what is lost. He raises his son back up. That's what he does. What is God's heart to restore you? When he sends the one that can actually do it and we are responsible for killing him, what does he do? He raises his son back up because he has not changed his agenda. It is to restore you. He wants to confer on you a kingdom. You may be sitting there going, I'm not worthy. I know none of us are worthy. He doesn't do it because we are worthy. He doesn't do it because we are good. He doesn't do it because we have earned it. He doesn't do it because we deserve it. He does it because he is God and he is full of grace and he has come to restore his intended purpose for our lives regardless of what we have done up to this point. That's a good place for an amen. That's a good place for an amen. 
This is the message translation of how Paul talks about this in the book of Romans. He said, yet the rescuing gift is not exactly parallel to the death-dealing sin. If one man's sin put crowds of people at the dead end abyss of separation from God, just think what God's gift poured through one man Jesus Christ will do. There's no comparison between that death-dealing sin and this generous life-giving gift. That's what Jesus offers us. The authority of God's kingdom is available through humility and service. That's how we experience his kingdom. God will not allow his authority to be hijacked so that we can take that power and use it for personal preferences. When Jesus is in the Garden of, e uh, Garden of Gethsemane, what does he pray? Adam and Eve in their garden, they wanted their will and they chose it and they exercised it. What does Jesus pray in his garden? Father, not my will your will be done. It's the opposite prayer of the first humans in every human sense. God's will to be done. So how do we access kingdom authority to make a difference in our world? I'm going to go through this really quickly. Present yourself to God in worship. Present yourself to God in worship. Psalm 100 says, enter his gates with thanksgiving. Enter his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. Psalm 22 puts it this way. You are holy enthroned on the praises of Israel. What is that passage telling us? Not that we're just propping God up with our praise, but that his throne is established in the heart of praising people who seek his will, that his authority, his kingdom begins to flow through them and into a world so desperate for kingdom authority. If you're going to present yourself before God in worship, use your voice. But let's just try a, a practice using of our voice. We're just going to say the word amen. Ready? On three. One, two, three. Amen. amen. Yeah, see? You have a voice. God intends you to use your voice. You may have had lots of people who have told you your voice doesn't matter in the world. God thinks your voice is very important. That's why he wants us to pray. One of the first things that happens in human life and one of the most significant to any parents that are in the room when it happens is when a baby is born, everyone waits to hear the voice of the baby. Doctors may be talking, nurses may be talking, a dad may be talking or passing out, a mom may be crying, like whatever else is going on, everybody's waiting for one thing. There comes the moment of delivery, and then the whole world waits to hear what that child's voice is going to sound like. That matters. Your voice is important. Bring yourself in, present yourself to God in worship, and lift your voice. All heaven is waiting to hear it. All heaven is waiting to hear it. So, and, and, when, and when you come to, to worship, just, what, are you, what are you supposed to say? Thank you. Okay. Thank you for what? Put a why in there. Why are you thankful? Why are you grateful? Why does this matter? It doesn't have to be long. Uh, present your heart to God for review. Present your self in worship. Present your heart for God to review. This is what it says in Psalm 139. Search me, O God. Know my heart. Test me. Know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Do you want to start exercising something besides your will? Ask God to start searching your heart. And what's amazing is he brings things to our attention not for condemnation, but for protection. You start dealing with those things now, it's unbelievable how much grief, pain, and sorrow that will save you from in days to come. Unbelievable. Present your day for direction. This is something a lot of people don't do. Uh, let's say, how many make to-do lists? How many are going to start making to-do lists at some point in your life? <laughs> And, and those of you are on, that do to-do lists, how many of you do to-do lists just on paper? You, you like the old analog systems, all right? And how many have digital options for that, okay? And how many have both options and that's what's messing your life up? Yeah, <laughs> it's kind of like that, yeah. So.
Present your day for direction. We have responsibilities in the day. You just lay them out before God. You know, well, I've got this meeting and I have this appointment, I have this task, I have this project. And you lay it out. This is the message translation of Psalm 5.3. It says, every morning I lay out the pieces of my life on your altar and watch for fire to descend. I read the story of a woman whose husband was in ministry and he passed away. It was very sudden, unexpected. He was, he was not, he was a young man. And she really struggled with that and just how do you navigate life moving forward? And, and this was one of the practices. She would, she would write down all the things that she was supposed to do and, and sometimes God wouldn't say anything. He just, she'd just present it before him, ask for help. But every once in a while would come this thought to her while she was laying this out and he would say, you don't have to do that today. You're not ready for that. And he would take off of her plate things that were life crushing. Sometimes he can put things on our plate that are life giving. Present your day for direction. This is what it says in Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. Once again, message translation. Trust God from the bottom of your heart. Don't try to figure everything out on your own. Don't try to figure everything out on your own. Listen for God's voice in everything you do, everywhere you go. He's the one who will keep you on track. Don't assume that you know it all. Run to God. Run from evil. Your body will glow with health. Your very bones will vibrate with life. Is that not good news? Present your day. God won't rearrange your schedule every day, but the times he does, it will really matter. Present your circles of influence. So many people think they have no influence in the world. You may have no title, you may not have much money. That doesn't mean you don't have influence. Your life makes a difference in someone else's life. Present those circles of influence. Family, children, spouses, parents, Present extended family, aunts, uncles, grandparents, grandchildren. Present your friends, present your neighbors, present your coworkers, present your church family. These are all circles of influence. And what are we asking for? The goal is for God's kingdom to influence them. And the question that you can ask is, how can I love them towards the kingdom? How can I serve them towards the kingdom? And if that's your prayer, it's unbelievable how much authority God will flow through your life to make a difference. I'm going to ask the worship team to come out. The big picture is not that Calvary Assembly becomes the most popular or coolest church to attend. The biggest picture is not whatever denominational alliance that we have becomes the most important or dominant denomination in the world. That's small peanuts to what God is doing in the world. And sometimes we get caught up with this. I've said it, I've, I wish I hadn't, but I have. And I've told people, you just need to serve something bigger than yourself. And the truth is, you just need to serve something or someone other than yourself. If we only give ourselves to bigger things, there's a lot of people that will never benefit from what God wants to release through our lives for them. And so there's a big picture. There's a kingdom that's being conferred on you. If you can stop worrying about who's more important or who's getting more or who has more, if you can stop worrying about who gets credit, if you can stop worrying about whether you're recognized or whether you're honored, if you can stop worried about, I feel intimidated or I'm not good enough, if you can stop worrying about, I don't know if I have the skills, I don't know if I have the talent, I don't know if I have the strength, I don't know if I have the ability, I can answer the question for all of those two right now. You don't, you don't, none of us do. That's the point. What we need, what we need is a kingdom conferred on us, an authority that is not ours, to do a will that is not ours, so that this place looks a little more like his place. Does that sound like a really good idea to you? Amen? Amen. Let's all stand together.